Hi, everyone, and welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us today on our Nonprofits and GIS webinar. Uh, my name is Eric Lovell, uh, and I am an account manager on the Nonprofit and Global Organization team at Esri. Before we dive into this webinar, I will note that this webinar is being recorded, uh, and we'll be posting the recording on our Nonprofit Organization's uh, website. So in addition to accessing this recording, you can check out previous webinars, sign up for additional, or to receive additional updates on future events. I am joined today by uh, two of my colleagues from the Nonprofit and Global Organizations team, um, Emily Swenson and Adam Pfister. We are also grateful to have a few special guests uh, from the nonprofit community who are here to discuss the impact of GIS on their organization's overall mission. Uh, we have Andrew Schroeder from Direct Relief, and Sofia Garcia, Sofia Garcia, and Jesus Garcia from Dolores Huerta Foundation. So, uh, excited to have them on board. We'll be using this webinar to explore modern GIS and highlight the patterns of GIS use among nonprofits. Uh, we also, we will also share some resources for getting started or deepening the way that your organization applies geography. We'll be opening up the floor for your questions, so please feel free to use the question box on the GoToWebinar interface as your questions come up, and we'll try to answer, uh, answer them to the best of our ability at the end of the presentation. Uh, just another point of housekeeping, uh, following the webinar, you'll be asked to take part in the short survey about your webinar experience. Please take a minute to fill out the survey as we use your feedback to plan and coordinate future webinar offerings. As you all know, our world faces tremendous challenges. We see this as we look to changes in our communities, our cities, agriculture systems, ecosystems, and climate. The pace of this change is accelerating, and it's doing so for many reasons, some of which are driven by data and technology, while others are driven by population, politics, and policies. And this is why we are all here. We're all concerned about how these challenges shape our collective futures. So what can you do? At Esri, we believe that the power of digital geography and GIS can help make the world a better place. Many of you are already doing this today, and for some of you, this may be new. Either way, there are tremendous opportunities to expand how and where we are applying digital geography to face these challenges. This includes engaging with citizens and our communities, protecting biodiversity, and designing more resilient strategies for the future. The heart of GIS is the power to integrate different kinds of information, like relating socioeconomic data and data on the physical or built environment. Being able to use this information, using geography to interrogate data differently, helps us understand relationships between things and phenomena in, different, different, in a deeper way. And importantly, GIS helps us to share our stories in a richer, more compelling way and engage with stakeholders engage stakeholders with the information that they need to understand what is happening where and why this is important to them. All of this creates a kind of understanding and helps to see the problem and solution in a different way. For those of you familiar with GIS, you might recognize that GIS is very different today than it was five years ago. The transformation of GIS has been driven by the rapid evolution of technology as well as innovation in geographic information systems and science. There's been an explosion of like location information and spatial data in the past five to 10 years. Each one of us are walking around with a sensor in our pocket collecting location data. We're also surrounded by sensors that enable smart houses, cities, agriculture, and ecosystems. Cloud computing has made it really easy to support large GIS data sets and complex computing requirements for spatial analysis and connectivity and access to GIS services anywhere. And GIS has seen tremendous innovation itself, including real-time data, innovative three-dimensional visualizations, artificial intelligence, and an overall heightened awareness to the power of geographic knowledge. These forces are creating a new pattern of integrated GIS, commonly referred to as a web GIS, which is making GIS easier, more open, and more accessible. Web maps are the medium that make, 
make this possible in a WebGIS. They combine and abstract all layers of information, capabilities and analytics, and other features of your maps uh, that we want to make accessible to, you, to your user community. This is a pattern that includes everyone, from those of you who are GIS administrators or analysts, to your constituents and communities that you want to reach out or whose feedback is central to your organization's mission. And at the heart of the WebGIS pattern, today's organi organizational GIS is ArcGIS Online. ArcGIS Online is Esri's integrated WebGIS platform for providing mapping, analysis, data management, and collaboration for your organization. At a high level, ArcGIS Online allows your organization to have a central data portal where your organization's spatial content resides. And your GIS users are accessing the data in the portal through focus apps and tools that allow them to con consume, edit, analyze, and create geographic data and content that can be shared out internally or made available as web maps and apps to the public. ArcGIS Online provides focused apps for GIS content and capabilities through a user experience that is appropriate for the user and their roles. We're going to take a look at some of, the, uh, some of these apps later in the webinar, and it's important to note that focused apps for specific purposes means that anyone in your organization can have access to intuitive and easy to use tools. Not everyone needs to be a trained GIS analyst to use location data and maps in the field, in the boardroom, or in the community. This user-centric framework transforms the way that we can share our work together. It is based on a concept of sharing and collaboration, sharing information, and leveraging web services to distribute and connect our knowledge to engage everyone, both within and across teams, organizations, and communities. Collaboration is possible through a variety of apps and capabilities and creative information products that are dynamic, interoperable. And since maps are one of the most common visual aids, they're also aesthetically pleasing. Some examples include story maps to integrate maps, data, and other mediums to present their project or mission in narrative form. Field mobility apps provide users with capabilities to capture data in the field and display it on uh, web maps in near real time. Or operations dashboards, which are commonly used to leverage responsive maps and data sources to create situational awareness within and across an organization. All of these apps are available through non the nonprofit user licenses, which we'll show off uh, more of them shortly. It's safe to say that the digital transformation is upon us all. This is where all of our digital information, processes, and workflows are integrated into the work that we do and the impact that we can have. WebGIS is definitely an influencer in this age. WebGIS, with WebGIS, you can embrace these digital patterns to collect and curate data-driven evidence, which can be transformed into evidence-based decision-making innovative ways to act and greater impact. And this is, a, this is just the beginning. Where you go with it really depends on the type of work that you do and your or mission uh, at hand. In order to explore some of these common ways that nonprofit organizations are leveraging this modern GIS model, I'm now going to turn it over to my colleague, Emily. Great, thank you, Eric. Uh, so now that we've explored what GIS looks like today and why it's important when we're talking about our shared future, let's take a look at how nonprofit organizations can and do apply ArcGIS apps and workflows to the important work that they lead. Across causes and the people, places, and ideas that each nonprofit is positioned to support, there are three powerful patterns or areas of work where we are seeing users apply GIS to their work and supporting their organizational success. These are the GIS patterns of use for nonprofit organizations. Target and plan, measure impact, and engage your community. We're going to dive into each of these patterns now to pose the kinds of questions that GIS helps nonprofits to answer, highlight some of the success stories that have come from applying GIS, 
and welcome our guest speakers to show tools and workflows in action. So with that, let's dive into target and plan. We start with what may be simple questions, but questions that most organizations have. Where are the relationships that matter to my organization? Where are my donors? Where are my members? Where are my beneficiaries? Many organizations have this information and it's often living in spreadsheets or other databases. When we use GIS to answer these questions, the result is putting dots on the map, but something almost magical happens when we visualize our stakeholders outside of spreadsheets and tables. We immediately start turning this map into information in our minds, seeing clusters, gaps, and other patterns. Visualizing and analyzing this data in a map sets us up to ask and answer more questions. Like now that I know where my existing stakeholders are, where are my stakeholders of tomorrow? Advancements to web-based spatial analysis tools and the accessibility of location data on the web have greatly enhanced the way we can ask the question of where. Powerful workflows allow us to discover, quantify, and understand the landscape of today and use it to make predictions about the landscape of tomorrow. Beyond targeting and planning to understand and deepen our relationships, leveraging GIS also allows us to answer questions about how we will direct our resources, efforts, and energy in the best way possible. Where should we allocate our resources, target our outreach, or focus our programs? I wanna share some examples of real nonprofits that have exemplified this GIS pattern of use in their work. United Way utilizes visualization and analysis to identify neighborhoods at high risk so, th so that they can target these areas when they make decisions around directing programs and investments. And Catholic Relief Services has transformed the way they plan their work on a food security project in Madagascar. They used predictive an analysis tools for optimizing the siting of food distribution locations to minimize the distances women and children had to travel to receive aid. You'll also see examples on the screen for conservation and land use planning, community and economic development, health and disaster response. And these really only scratch the surface. Let's take a look at the, let's take a look at the technology in action. I'm going to turn it over to Adam Fister to show a workflow that nonprofits can use to target donors. Everything Adam is about to show is in a fully online and intuitive environment. Take it away, Adam. Thanks, Emily. I'd like to demonstrate how you can use ArcGIS Community Analyst to target and plan using a simple scenario involving donors and their communities. ArcGIS Community Analyst is a cloud-based mapping solution that provides simple and easy to use GIS capabilities to every user. Providing access to thousands of demographic, census, health, income, and community variables to formulate better decisions. Let's take an example scenario. Last month, a nonprofit received donations from 20 new individual donors. Let's bring that data into Community Analyst to use our, our donors location information to better target and plan our outreach to other more potential donors with similar characteristics. Bringing these donors into Community Analyst is simple. Just browse to your spreadsheet and import them into your project. Because my data already has latitude and longitude for each row, I'm able to use that information to plot each donor on the map. If I needed to, I could take different address components and use a geocoding service to turn those into points on the map. Let's turn on the option to reverse geocode the coordinates so we can add our addresses back to the data. Now I have each donor location added. I can also choose to add each point as a site. Adding each point as a site in Community Analyst will allow me to perform analysis of the surrounding areas. For each point, I would like to create a five minute drive time that will go around each location. Adding 
as the map works through creating the drive times around each location, it will define certain information for each point and then set up the layer for use in Community Analyst. So now I have my five minutes around each donor. Clicking on a single area allows me to see information about that area, the attributes, as well as do things like look at reports, infographics, comparisons, add photos, or even edit the area I just created. Since we are interested in all of the, all of the donors and their combined areas, let's bring all of these individual drive times into a single polygon site. And let's rename it so it's something a little bit more descriptive. Now we can investigate the information available to us for this site. In Community Analyst, there's a wealth of information pre-built for your use in the form of reports. For our combined areas, we will investigate the tapestry segmentation area profile. Once that report is finished, it will open up a new window for us to view the report. As we demographers have sliced and diced the US population into 67 unique tapestry segments based on demographic and lifestyle data, we can use this information to get insight into the makeup of communities, commonly shared characteristics like what they buy or how they spend their free time. For example, we see that Metro Renters is the dominant tapestry segment for the areas in which our donors live. What does that mean? The flyer for Metro Renters segment provides a summary of the community makeup and allows you to drill into information such as the kind of stores that they frequent or the fact that they take public transportation. This can inform the kind of outreach you might consider, for instance, advertising for an event on the train. There are thousands of other demographic and market variables that you can access about any given area, working your way as far down as the block group level. These variables can be exposed through simple yet powerful tools. Tools such as color code and maps, smart map search showing businesses and facilities, or running a suitability analysis. Let's look at smart map search. That allows you to select up to five variables to map and filter the areas. So let's select some variables to identify locations that may meet a certain criteria. The data browser allows me to view these variables grouped into, into certain common categories, such as at risk. So this gives us a quick view of the important variables grouped together in the at risk category. So let's look at some variables by some keywords. So maybe we wanna look at the households below the poverty level, those requiring assistance through food stamps or other programs, and maybe just the total population. This, this will retrieve the data from the Esri service and allow you to further refine what you see on the map. And let's use the sliders to add some criteria to filter the information and visualize the data on the map. So within a few clicks and a few filters, I'm able to see target certain areas that I may be interested in, in this case, looking at areas of at-risk population. Another built-in tool such as infographics allow you to prov or provide you with a straightforward and simple way to consume this information or share it out. Esri provides a large number of templates that you can select from to get started. You can see listed here as marketing profile, an infographic for at-risk population, or nearby locations. Let's view an infographic for our Chicago area donors. By selecting infographics from the pop-up, a default infographic is immediately shown. And in our case, we'll be looking at the demographic infographic. There's a demographic summary.
I can choose to view the infographic in full screen and I can view clearly, clearly all of the widgets that have been configured but now populated with data for our area. And let's change this one to something that's a little bit more uh, informative for what we're looking at, like the tapestry profile. So a PDF may, may suffice in certain situations, but sometimes a more dynamic interaction is more appropriate. So this infographic allows me to hover over the elements to see how variables were calculated or to even filter information on the chart itself. By understanding our current donors and their socioeconomic traits, we can then look into other areas that have similar characteristics. ArcGIS Community Analyst provides an incredible amount of power to your users that allow you to effectively target your communities to plan to have the most impact. Emily, back to you. Great, thank you, Adam. So moving on to the second GIS pattern of use for nonprofits, measure impact. This pattern highlights the ways that nonprofits can use GIS to better understand their progress and the outcomes of their work. Lending itself to questions like, are we working in the right places? Are we reaching the people or places most in need? Are we on the path to success? And what can we do better? To measure impact, an organization must identify the indicators and data that reflect progress toward their goals. This is where the data collection, integration, and analysis capabilities of GIS can bring new ways to understanding progress, outcomes, and overall impact. Collection may involve the creation of data in the field. The technology to enable a mobile workforce to access, assess, and collect information in real time. Integration means leveraging secondary or proxy data, such as demographic and lifestyle data, to gain a comprehensive understanding of mission success. Analysis includes the application of spatial analysis tools to help us understand the success and areas for improvement within and across our projects and programs. Some examples of nonprofits who have leveraged GIS to measure impact include Capital Area Food Bank, measuring the pounds of food that they deliver to their targeted communities across Washington, DC, and using GIS to identify the communities in which they're meeting demand and those where there are gaps or unmet needs. Democracy Lab's use of field mobility apps and crowdsourcing to monitor and report incidents of voter suppression or other issues surrounding the right to vote. And a wealth of examples of organizations using GIS to monitor the outbreak of a disease or illness and then track the effectiveness of their efforts so they can adjust. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Andrew Schroeder of Direct Relief to show you how they've been using GIS to measure impact. Thanks, can you hear me okay? Yes. Um, so my name is Andrew Schroeder. I'm the Director of Research and Analysis for Direct Relief. Um, and I'm gonna be talking about some work that we did uh, using GIS to help us monitor impact in uh, program investment after Hurricane Maria. Um, just a quick word on Direct Relief. Uh, we're a global nonprofit organization based in California, uh, focused on um, delivery of essential medicines, um, improving access to uh, medicines, medical supplies, and equipment with local healthcare providers throughout the world. Um, and after Hurricane Maria, we worked extensively in Puerto Rico. Uh, one of the things we found was uh, that uh, in order to be able to meet the medical needs of the population, we had to meet the power needs as well. So uh, the project that I'm gonna focus in on is a project uh, specifically on energy resilience in, uh, in Puerto Rico. This is also a collaboration with the Clinton Foundation, the, and I'll get into more of the collaborative parts of this later. Um, this is a story map that um, helps to explain explain uh, the project that I'll talk about in a second. Um, just a little bit of background, um, as I think a lot of you all know, um, after Hurricane Maria, uh, there was a extensive blackout six months uh, in, in many places. Uh, it was the longest blackout in US history, um, and it had uh, really sort of significant ripple effects through every aspect of Puerto Rican society. Um, 
the uh, areas that were impacted uh, disproportionately were throughout the interior of the island in particular. They were uh, disproportionately poor, uh, places that were uh, subject to a crisis in a number of other ways. Uh, health clinics were one of the key uh, institutions that lost power. 80% of the uh, medicine that required cold storage on the island was spoiled during the course of this outbreak. Uh, so without power, uh, there was a significant impact upon other parts of the island, other health conditions that folks faced. Children were put out of school for months. Um, and one of the kind of key demands for recovery afterwards was in investment in resilient power structure. Um, that meant primarily solar energy. So Puerto Rico obviously gets a lot of sunshine um, and there was a new opportunity to begin building solar infrastructure throughout critical facilities on the island. Um, so we teamed up with uh, a number of donors with the Clinton Foundation, with other partners um, in the health uh, industry throughout the island, uh, and began um, investing in solar infrastructure and uh, understanding where uh, those uh, investments not only needed to be made, where they were being made, where the projects were succeeding, um, and how they were um, impacting the communities that were uh, receiving that, that uh, new resilient power supply. Uh, some examples of where uh, those investments went in uh, were in health infrastructure, um, looking in an, uh, communities that were needing uh, solar power to power water pumps um, uh, and in other areas of the island. Um, these images that you see of the map are from a application that we built um, called the Puerto Rico Solar Map. Um, so the Puerto Rico Solar Map um, is based on operations dashboard, the ESRI tool. Um, the um, story map I was just showing you is actually available as a link through, uh, through this application. Um, and it compiles data on 178 total projects uh, throughout the island. Uh, there are of many different kinds. Uh, so direct relief um, is um, able to focus in specifically on projects that are uh, funded through our organization, uh, but we're only one part of a much larger movement towards improving community power resilience throughout the island. Um, each one of these um, can be kind of brought up uh, looking at uh, the characteristics of that particular site. So this is a site, uh, Servicio de Salud Primarios de Barceloneta. Um, it looks at who the other funders are, um, sort of key variables for that site, um, what the generation capacity was at that site, um, the uh, carbon avoided at that site, um, what other uh, kind of loads were being backed up. So they're uh, focusing specifically on refrigerators and their information technology capacity um, and what the status of that project is. So that is uh, one of the largest projects um, in this kind of grassroots uh, resilient power uh, fo uh, focus, but it's um, um, in process, uh, you know, that doesn't, I'm not completely sure when the, when the completion date is, but we're there about halfway through. Um, if you kind of zoom back out to the entire area, you can see um, over here, we put in key indicators uh, that uh, were agreed upon kind of across the board from all participants in the project as being valuable for understanding um, the scope of investment um, and the impact that that investment was having. So. Um, on the capacity side, we're looking at how much power is being generated, um, how much battery capacity is being added so that that uh, power that's being generated can be stored and utilized effectively. Um, what that means in terms of cost savings, which was one of the kind of key um, indicators for success across the board. So if you had to otherwise buy that electricity, at prevailing rates from the grid, what would that electricity have cost you? 
um, it doesn't completely capture the full benefit, actually, given that uh, we're talking about um, being able to have reliance on uh, backup power in the event that you're not able to buy any electricity at all, such as in, during the case of the blackout. But um, in a long-term kind of transformative um, uh, view, what uh, is the cost savings that's associated with shifting a significant portion of your uh, generation load over into solar uh, electricity? And then uh, what is the uh, carbon offset that that represents? So how many um, tons of CO2 are being avoided across the island based upon that, uh, based upon that um, new investment? Um, and then this is sortable and, and, uh, and filterable based upon types of projects, based upon um, uh, the scale of projects, uh, both in terms of power generation and uh, number of projects and the types of institutions, like I said, um, not only health clinics, which were the focus for direct relief, uh, but the focus of our partners in um, improving access for fire stations, for schools, for water pumps, um, et cetera, um, and then kind of being able to show that as a island-wide kind of movement towards improved grassroots level uh, energy resilience. So uh, one of the real impacts of this map overall for us has been uh, the ability to get that view into the hands of as many people as possible. So this was shared out and utilized by the governor's office um, as part of the view in terms of where they were looking at um, it, uh, energy resilience investment priorities in many other ways. Um, all these organizations are, are able to use this map uh, on their own uh, to be able to highlight their own work. So we're, um, you know, one organization uh, that's attempting to highlight this work, but because there's many other organizations represented in this map, part of the benefit here in the uh, sharing context is, is to allow others to take that exact same information, that exact same visualization, and really highlight the work that they're doing as well. Um, and uh, to make it so that um, there's a kind of broad awareness in the media, uh, so an easy reference out to um, show that uh, aid dollars are actually working in this case. Um, so um, there's a lot of discussion about, um, you know, uh, being, you know, people often can't see uh, where the aid investment is. Um, they hear rumors about, you know, FEMA has $70 billion, where is it? Um, at least in this case, um, we can show very tangibly um, where all those dollars went and, and uh, what the beneficiaries are of, uh, of that investment. Um, the, just a really quick word on, on how this is put together. The, like I said, this is a collaborative project um, in the, uh, from, all, from sort of start to finish. The, the, this is actually a remarkably easy project to put together. Technically, the data for this is hosted just in a shared spreadsheet on Microsoft OneDrive that's maintained by Direct Relief. Um, we collaborate with um, the, our colleagues at the Clinton Foundation to jointly update that data and validate it. Um, the spreadsheet feeds into Operations Dashboard. Uh, we did a lot of configuration on Operations Dashboard to get this to, to work correctly and, and show the indicators that we, uh, that we wanna show. Um, and then it's placed into to ArcGIS Hub, which is a, 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 a web application, a website development tool uh, aimed at, at community collaboration um, that allows us to have a unique URL really easily for this site. And that is where you get to PuertoRicoSolarMap.org. Um, we're going to be building out additional applications on this. So as um, there's more um, community development and engagement around this problem, uh, through ArcGIS Hub, we can we can build out new applications, data collection, uh, crowdsourcing, et cetera, uh, to continue expanding out the view of the problem. And that's about it. Great, thank you, Andrew. Uh, the third and final pattern is engage your community. This is where GIS is helping nonprofits to ask and answer questions like, how can we advocate for our cause? market our successes, and tell our story. Modern GIS allows us to communicate through maps, to put important geographic information in the hands of our audience, or digitally bring someone to a street corner or mountain meadow to more effectively communicate what it is we care about so much. Further, how can we ensure it's a two-way street? How do we increase collaboration with our audience, promote transparency, foster the exchange of information? 
Often we rely on our communities to drive the greater mission forward, and GIS gives us a medium for crowdsourcing, citizen science, and data exchange within and across those communities. Some of the examples from the Esri user community that exemplify this pattern include Rails to Trails Conservancy, making available their analysis of Milwaukee's bike trails in order to bring people together in advocating for greater connectedness in their city. And the Grand Canyon Trust, leveraging GIS to get the attention of their audience and communicate the importance of culture and place through maps and other visual mediums. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Sofia and Jesus of Dolores Huerta Foundation to show you how they've been using GIS to engage communities. Are we on? Okay. Yeah. All right. Great. So hi everyone. Good morning uh, for the West Coasters. Uh, we have I'm Sofia Garcia. I'm the GIS analyst for the Dolores Huerta Foundation, and we have Jesus Garcia, who's the GIS consultant for the Dolores Huerta Foundation. Um, great. So the Dolores Huerta Foundation was award or Dolores Huerta was awarded the Puffin Nation Prize for creative citizenship for her lifetime commitment of activism. With those funds, she established the Dolores Huerta Foundation in 2003. Today, at age 89 years, um, 89 years of age, Dolores remains active with DHF as its board president and full-time unpaid volunteer. She sees the work of the foundation as a continuation of her nonviolent civil rights movement of the 1960s and 70s. Camila Chavez, Dolores' youngest daughter, has served as executive director since its inception in 2003, growing the organization to a staff of over 25 trained organizers, advocates, and researchers. DHF uses a grassroots house meeting organizing model to recruit members and volunteers. Participants are brought together to form local community organizations, Vecinos Unidos chapters. DHF organizers lead the Vecinos Unidos chapters to first identify the critical needs in their communities. Vecinos Unidos members then learn to work with their neighbors to bring about change in their respective communities by developing campaigns, building alliance, alliances, and communicating with public officials. DHF provides support and training to chapters so they can make changes in policies affecting education, health, the environment, civil rights, and economic development. The Zenos Unidos chapters stress civic engagement, leadership development, and youth empowerment. There are now nine Vecinos Unidos chapters in Arvin, Lamont, Weed Patch, Greenfield, Bakersfield, California City, Woodlake, Lindsay, Singer, and Parlier, and parent committees in 11 school districts. Um, in 2018, DHF launched the Youth and Family Civic Engagement Initiative with the Martin Luther King Jr. Freedom Center to develop diverse youth leadership to empower and enhance their lives, utilizing an inclusive social justice curriculum and hands-on civic participation projects. So they can take an active role in advocating for community improvements and policy changes at the local, state, and federal level. And in 2017, DHF established its GIS department. Um, the objective of our department is to continue to integrate GIS and data applications into the organiza organization's technological infrastructure in order to use data and mapping to equip and enhance DHF's organizing and civic engagement efforts, such as voter engagement, education, and preparing for the 2020 census. So the legislative tool um, came up when we were speaking with our president and executive director, and their objective was to have a map where our organizers could easily look up the representatives of the Sinos during a house meeting, a general meeting, or any event. Prior to the creation of this tool, it was not easy to identify who was responsible for fixing local issues. The data that was compiled for the project could not have happened without the assistance of multiple local, local government GIS departments, and we wanna give a shout out to all the county, city, and state GIS departments who maintain these data sets. The California legislative tool will help community members develop a deeper understanding of their various electoral districts, 
The tool will allow people to tangibly engage with their representatives by harnessing the power of geography, local residents will be able to easily identify who represents them at all levels of government, be civically engaged, and have a point of contact to reach out to with local and state concerns. And we just scroll through and you could see the different um, layers that we have available. And Jesus, take it away. So what I, so DHFGIS has existed for about two or three years now. And during that, process, uh, there's been a number of other projects, including a, 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 a map that was created to assist in the foundation um, seeking people to sign up for health care. There's also an initiative to look at the issue of Black and Latino youth expulsion from schools, address the issue of the school to prison pipeline. And most recently, we've uh, had a, a year-long effort to redistrict uh, our local current high school district. But what we're doing now is those are projects that we have done on behalf of, uh, of the organization. What Dolores wants now is to be able to provide tools that the community themselves can utilize. And so as Sophia mentioned, we've, uh, we've developed this, uh, this uh, GIS lookup tool. And so in this tool, people will be able to look at, um, at the different factors. And so what began as an effort to present information at the San Joaquin level, uh, which is our home area here in Kern County, uh, quickly turned into addressing the concerns statewide. And so, so what, we're, what we're in the midst of is creating an application that will allow residents of California to look up every uh, school, every member of the Board of Supervisors, every legislator uh, from Congress, from state assembly, from the state senate. Uh, we're also expanding to include others' information, such as uh, school districts, or uh, even specific information like community college. So it's a very simple application uh, where you just type in your address. I'm sure many of you people have seen this. And so this takes you down to uh, a location, let's say here in Bakersfield. We turn on a couple of layers. We click on that point. And as you can see, uh, we now have, this is, uh, this area is part of the current high school district. It is part of within the Bakersfield City School District. Uh, our assembly member here is Vince Fong. And so you click on that, that website and it sends you directly to their site. So it's a, it's a very straightforward, relatively easy application that allows the community members now to connect with who their representative are. Our goal is to expand this. So it's quite easily to, uh, to identify your state legislator, assemblyman, senator, congressman, uh, board of supervisor. It's much harder to begin to find out who is in charge of the, your water district or your school board. And so on that note, we are hoping to get the community or, or at large, the GIS community at large, to possibly assist us in that, that effort. Um, Dolores, when we presented at uh, ESRI last year, um, modified her chant a little bit. And so this is the chant that Dolores has came up. Uh, who's got the power? We got the power. What kind of power? People power. Who's got the power? We kind of power. What kind of power? Mapping power. And so this is a, a new chat that Dolores has come up with. And so we are asking you to get involved, uh, to help us in identifying um, the, 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 the websites and locations of other uh, bodies that might serve a community. As I mentioned, we have the legislative look of tool now for, uh, for state legislators, um, for border supervisors, but once we start looking at uh, city councils and school boards and water boards, the task is much greater than Sophia and I can do by ourselves. So we're gonna have a shout out to, uh, if you wanna get involved with us, we would love to communicate with you uh, and, and, and basically give you some assignments that you can help us in this goal of expanding this tool so that it has an even wider application than just what we've begun here in Kern County and the Central Sawakin Valley.
Thank you. Thank you. Great. <laughs> Thank you, Sophia and Jesus. So that wraps up our exploration of the GIS patterns of use for nonprofits. We're really hoping that some of these examples resonate with you. Uh, we'd now like to take a few minutes to ensure you're aware of other resources that may help you get started or deepen your use of GIS today. I'd first like to say that at Esri, we are a software company that does more than build software. We're here to promote sp spatial literacy and the power of geographic knowledge to address science, social justice, and the greater good. We're a team of thousands passionate about geography and enabling users to make a difference through its application. This is evidenced in the way we're structured, the way we work, and our commitment to make GIS available and accessible to organizations like yours, along with attention to the resources and community that will make you successful. Here's an overview of the ArcGIS apps that Esri makes available to meet your needs. Those demonstrated today were, were Community Analyst, Operations Dashboard, Web App Builder, and the Story Maps data. Note that most of these apps are included and ready to use with your subscription to ArcGIS Online. You can access them on the ArcGIS Online home screen using the app selector in the upper right corner. Apps like Community Analyst are add-ons, which are still available to nonprofits with the subscription. As you can see on the screen, there are a number of other applications we didn't cover today that expand what's possible. I want to call special attention to the Esri Story Maps application. It's included with your ArcGIS subscription and allows you to quickly and easily create stunning story maps to share internally or to the public. Visit the gallery using the URL on the screen to peruse thousands of public facing story maps, many of which come from the nonprofit community. This also gives me a moment to say that story maps, like other applications, are constantly receiving updates to provide users with an enhanced experience. Stay tuned for the summer 2019 story maps release or sign up for the beta on our website today. I'd next like to ensure that everyone with an ArcGIS subscription knows that they have access to the Esri Living Atlas, the foremost collection of global geographic information, census and American community survey data, thousands of current demographic and lifestyle variables, facilities, roads, and infrastructure, $60 million worth of data content that Esri curates and our team of demographers add to and make projections from reside in this online portal. Beyond that, the vibrant GIS community has shared millions of maps and layers to the Living Atlas. View all of this content using the link on the screen or pull any of it directly into your maps through ArcGIS Online. Esri's education services team makes sure that our users are set up for lifelong learning of GIS concepts and applications. You can access web courses, seminars, and videos on the Esri training site many of which are no cost to users. The ArcGIS book and learn lessons linked to on the screen are both fun and beautiful places to begin. There are a number of ways you can participate in the GIS user community. Join us in July at the Esri User Conference, a regional conference, or a local meetup and seminar. You can find out more about these happenings on our events page. And if you're not already part of the virtual community, GeoNet, I encourage you to join today. GeoNet is a space for users to engage with one another and Esri experts to share ideas, advice, challenges, and answers. The link is on the screen. And for those of you that have yet to join the Esri user community, you can get started with a fully functioning copy of ArcGIS for 21 days. Visit the link on the screen to sign up. No matter where you are in your GIS journey, we're proud to support you in the important work that you're leading. You're part of a community of over 10,000 nonprofits and global organizations that are making a difference in our world today with digital geography. And we have a program in place to get the tools that nonprofits need in their hands quickly and easily. This is the Esri Nonprofit Organization Program. As an eligible nonprofit, you can get started by visiting esri.com nonprofit to apply for the program and begin using Esri solutions at the nominal nonprofit rates. If you're already part of the program, you can find out more about what's available to you or discuss new or changing needs by reaching out to a nonprofit program representative at nonprofit underscore inquiry at esri.com. And if you've done something that you'd like to share, please do. 
We love to see the impressive things that the nonprofit GIS community is up to. Send these to the email alias nonprofit underscore inquiry at esri.com. With that, and before we open the floor to questions, I'll ask, how can you harness the power of geography to act? We are here to help you envision what's possible in your organizations and beyond. Learn new tools, adopt new patterns, and explore new applications. Thank you. Okay, and we do have a few questions rolling in, and if you have questions, please do uh, use the uh, questions uh, panel on the GoToWebinar uh, control panel to uh, ask away. Um, so we do have a question um, specifically uh, for Andrew at Direct Relief uh, and regarding the Puerto Rico Solar Map Project. Um, the uh, individual asks, uh, it sounded like you have uh, made it, or that sounded like you created a custom app. Who did the programming for this app, and what did it cost roughly? The app is the app integrated into ArcGIS Online or ArcGIS Desktop. Thanks. Yeah, no, that's actually not really a custom app. It's a configured app. Uh, so Operations Dashboard is an um, uh, out-of-the-box tool with um, a number of data widgets um, that can be figured in, in fairly flexible ways. Um, so um, we took Operations Dashboard and uh, did quite a bit of configuration of those of those widgets, um, including data configuration to make the indicators show up correctly. Um, but there was no additional cost actually associated with programming that particular application, which is, I think, one of the real benefits of it, that, um, that you could get quite a lot of mileage without um, doing any kind of custom coding um, or, or trying to bring in uh, consultants on that. Great. And was this all uh, configured, worked out um, through ArcGIS Online or through ArcGIS Desktop? All through ArcGIS Online. Um, desktop, you know, helps with some of the data management, basically um, helping to uh, publish feature services that help to drive the data on the map. Um, but the map application is all ArcGIS Online. Excellent. And we have another question here uh, re regarding the tapestry data that was uh, that um, Adam had demonstrated. And the question is, how does uh, the tapestry data hold up in rural uh, areas? Right, and as a uh, as a company that provides data sets for global areas, and I think maybe I can touch on the other question as well for uh, data outside the U.S. Um, it's it's available in more than 135 countries, and those data sets range from population, households, uh, healthcare, and so on. Uh, you can access recent demographics about si family size, income, unemployment, and a, a lot more. There really is a, a wealth of information available to you. Um, as far as the specifics on the countries and the coverage, uh, we can refer you to our community analyst documentation page. And we actually have an app that will let you click on different parts of, of the world, different countries, and see what data collections are available, including the coverage for tapestry information. So I'll actually put that in the chat uh, in response to a few questions so that you all have it. Excellent, thank you, Adam. Uh, and and we have a question here that is uh, open uh, open to all presenters here. Um, there's a question about the quality assurance, quality control um, dimensions of of your work or working with geospatial data. Uh, and the question is, uh, how can we or how can you verify that information inputs are true? Are there timestamps uh, or some sort of public checking system? Uh, for your data uh, collection process. Hi, this is Asus with the Dolores Huerta Foundation. All of our information is verified um, data that we've gotten either from Census Tiger or is our own information, such as the Vecinos locations. Um, we we don't create we the only data that we've created would be the our Vecinos data specifically. But as far as the legislative tool lookup, all of that are verified boundaries that we pull off uh, from the Census Tiger. Um, and, and, and then we've gone into uh, looking up the individual links. And that's been actually a very interesting process because I've learned the variety of 
uh, of, of data that's presented at the county uh, specifically with the Board of Supervisors. Um, so again, we utilize verified outside sources for the majority of our work. Great, thank you. In, in my case, really quick, just um, the it's a it's a combination of things. Um, so there's one um, there's one set of uh, data that is location data so that's for health centers for instance is is publicly verified information uh through the federally qualified health centers and other um there's there's also uh water points etc so there's there's infrastructure is is actually third party verified from from a number of different sources um we do actually have to uh, receive information from people that um, is survey information about projects. Um, that's all been standardized and there's been uh, organizational vetting that's been done to uh, assure uh, quality control on the survey information. Um, I do think that that's actually kind of a constant process of checking in and um, kind of that's one of the reasons to make the data public is to uh, encourage uh, verification on that data, allow people to know where the projects are and to um, do ground truthing um, as needed. So part of that is actually just making the map application into a kind of living knowledge uh, sharing hub. And that uh, is something which just requires time and, and energy and, and community commitment to make sure that uh, everything that goes in is, is accurate. Excellent. Thank you, Andrew. Um, a few other questions, and please feel free to, in our last three minutes, if you have a, a question, please do post. Um, we do have a question regarding uh, accessing this uh, webinar. So as, as we stated in the beginning, uh, the webinar will be or has been recorded, and this uh, recording will be available on our uh, nonprofit organization program website. Um, so please uh, give it um, perhaps uh, a week, uh, and we will send uh, uh, we'll send a notification out when the when the webinar is available. Uh, but do check that website periodically for additional updates on on future events, future um, webinars, and so forth. And this is Emily. I'll just jump in to say that if there are questions after you've wrapped up or we've wrapped up today, don't hesitate to reach out to Eric or or myself. Our email addresses are on the screen. And then the other email address that was shared um, a few slides prior, the nonprofit underscore inquiry at esri.com um, is a great place to reach out and connect with a nonprofit program representative to discuss your organization's specific needs um, or follow up with questions surrounding any of this, any of this content that we've shared today. Uh, and we do have a, another question that has come in uh, and just asking if um, the ArcGIS suite uh, or applications uh, can be integrated in with existing uh, customer uh, 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 current, or sorry, CRM, uh, customer relation management systems, uh, or project management software. If I can take that one. Um, yes, that's a great question. Uh, ArcGIS, the apps are built using uh, a REST framework. It's, it's built on services. It's all services based. So if you have an existing applications or things that you use in a day-to-day -day workflow and uh, you want to pull data from ArcGIS you can certainly do that or if you wanted to build a more tightly um, uh, if we wanted to build a more tight integration between ArcGIS and your um, another software there are certain ways to do that uh, and it's certainly available and I think the there's another question here I'll just take on um, an example of using ArcGIS online to use uh, to allow a nonprofit to select an area of interest with a couple of clicks, generate a text message to sell numbers of donors and beneficiaries in that area. So that I mean that that's a it's a pretty specific workflow, and you can certainly do that out of the box with configurable apps. Uh, if you have the information in your uh, system about uh, who the donors are and how they'd like to be contacted, you can certainly use ArcGIS to kind of assemble that into maybe a template of what your text message would say, so that when a user selected an area of interest, it could generate that for you. Um, but then you would need to use a certain, um, you would use, need to use like an SMS-based service provider to actually send those text messages. Thank you, Adam. And, and with that, we are at time. So again, we truly appreciate your attendance today. And um, just another note, this webinar will be available uh, 
uh, shortly online, uh, and, and please feel free to reach out to Emily or I uh, if you do have any additional questions. Uh, thank you again for your time today, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, everybody.